So both of my parents are from South Carolina. My father's from Hartsville, South Carolina. My mother's from a place called Spartanburg outside of Greenville. And they met at Claflin College, a small liberal arts uh, HBCU uh, in South Carolina and met, my mother got pregnant at Claflin and my parents married and went on um, establishing their lives. I have three older brothers. My oldest brother is Charles Reed. I'm the second oldest is Carlton Reed. And the third oldest uh, is my brother, Tracy Reed. So my family, they had um, four boys and my dad wanted a different community to raise his family. And so um, he set out and made the decision, um, thankfully for me, to set roots in Atlanta. Um, I was actually born in Plainfield, New Jersey, but I was born there because my dad was on a business trip. He was working on an extended assignment in Plainfield. My mother went to visit him. And so I was actually born in Plainville, Plainfield, but my entire life has been spent in the city of Atlanta. Um, I went to public schools here. I went to a small school called Utoy Springs Elementary, which is you know probably three miles from where I'm sitting today. Uh, and I went to a high school called Westwood High School. It's now Westlake. And so Greg, my entire life has been spent within three miles of where I'm sitting right now. My mm -hmm. brother Tracy, actually lives in our family home. So the, the home that I was in all of my life is still in my family and my brother Tracy um, lives there. And before he moved into the house, I lived there. I actually bought the house uh, from my dad. Um, I live in Southwest Atlanta. Uh, it's a very historic part of the city. Um, if you um, have read Tom Wolfe's book, A Man in Full, <laughs> community that he writes about is a community that I live in. And so basically uh, it has been the seat of the black political class and business class uh, in the city of Atlanta that made so many of the strides that um, Atlanta is now known for around the world. So for instance, um, if you were here and we got in a car together, uh, we could be at the home of former Congressman John Lewis in about six minutes, um, a Presidential Medal of Freedom. We would be at the home of C.T. Vivian before he passed, a, another Presidential Medal of Freedom winner. In about eight minutes, we could get to Ambassador Young's house in about 10 to 12 minutes. And then we could drive about two minutes from Ambassador Young's house, and we would get to Hank Aaron's home, another Presidential Medal of Freedom winner. Uh, in going to those places, we would pass by the home of Dr. Joseph Laurie, another Presidential Medal of Freedom winner. And if we were to make a right and go down Fairburn Road, um, we would be at the home of uh, Dr. Ralph Abernathy and uh, his wonderful wife, <clears throat> Juanita. The point I'm making is, is that um, the bedrock of the civil rights movement in the city of Atlanta has probably been within 10, 12, 15 minutes my whole life. And so the Bond family, um, Julian Bond and his family, um, were about 15 minutes away from where we, where we sit. And so I say all of the time that uh, Atlanta is a very intentional city. And these people were the bedrock of the community that has made Atlanta move from a sleepy Southern town to one of the, certainly the most dynamic city in the South, Southeastern region of the United States. And then uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dr. King, I think his last address was on Sunset Avenue. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. And so and Dr. King lives Four, three to five houses down from Julian Bond's house. Right, right. So last home was on Sunset. So right. um, I could go, I could reach Dr. King's house in about 15 minutes if you and I were um, doing Jay Leno's car show. <laughs> well, I don't have Jay Leno's kind of money, so that's not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, uh, how far were you from, or how far are you from the Atlanta University Center? 
I'm about 15 minutes from me and I'm University Center. So there is all that history in that area. Yes. And all the Southwest Atlantic. And it is remarkable. And I'm so glad that you're that you're able to explain that to people who will be watching this of just how concentrated all that talent and skill and ambition and drive was. And it had to have, I'm guessing, an impact on your own development as you began to see your own path forward in politics and public service. Absolutely. And how old were you when you first became aware of who all these people were, whether it was Dr. King, uh, Reverend Abernathy, QV Williamson, Marvin Arrington, Andy Young, C.T. Vivian? I mean, the list can go on for more time than we all have. All of those things we would drive by going to one person's house or another. So the straight answer to your question is I became really started becoming aware of these individuals about nine, eight, nine, ten years old. Um, because you encountered them at your gas stations and in your grocery stores, and you could feel from your own parents that these folks are a very big deal. So it has a special impact on me when my parents got excited to see or meet someone. And so in a grocery store, for example, and it wasn't uncommon to see any of these folks strolling through the grocery store. And they were so kind and so generous of spirit um, that they would shake your hand, spend one or two minutes saying hello um, as they went on their way. And then uh, my father had a friendship with a woman named Dorothy Cotton, mm -hmm. who was very close to C.T. Vivian. And so they would come over my home socially when I was nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. And I would hear about uh, their experiences in the civil rights, rights movement. Uh, just very directly over long evenings um, of spades uh, and other board games. Yeah. Well, that's certainly a remarkable way to grow up. When, when people think of Atlanta as the cradle of the civil rights movement, they do refer to all the people that you've talked about. But what's often overlooked is the Atlanta student movement. Yes. Lonnie King, Julian Bond, Joe Pierce, Ben Brown, Herschel Sullivan, uh, Carol, Carolyn Long, I mean, you know, the list of people, again, that goes on and on, Marion Wright, who became Marion Wright Edelman, Frank Smith, Charles Black. When did you first become aware of the Atlanta student movement and the contributions they were making? And how as a young person who aspired to a career again in politics and public service, was the youth of that movement inspirational to you? We always look to historical figures of a certain age as kind of having done that. And we're, we're impressed by that. But then we're looking at these kids who were 18, 19, 21 years old, who were taking on entrenched segregation. They were taking on a system that was slow to bend. Yes. Well, I became aware of it certainly by 11. Uh, I decided I was going to be mayor of Atlanta when I was 13 years old. So I'll give you a quick story on what happened. Please Ambassador do. Young gave the men's day speech at Ben Hill United Methodist Church, another important church in the Southwest Atlanta community. And I remember the morning, I still remember it, I'm 52 years old today. I okay. remember it like Happy it birthday. was yesterday. No, thank you very much. I remember it like it was yesterday. I mean, my mother was just, I mean, that day for church, she got up extra early. She prepared all four of her boys to the teeth. And I was just wondering why is she, I mean, what is different about this Sunday than every other Sunday? And she was so excited because Ambassador Andrew Young was there. And so that definitely had an impact on me. And once again, you know, your parents, your mom and dad shape you more powerfully than anything else. And I remember going to the men's day speech. And at that time, I was 13, I had a really strange high top fade, a lot of hair on the top, almost none on the sides. And I really spent a lot of time fixing it. <laughs> and after the service, Ambassador Young was leaving and came out of the pulpit. And my mother was just shaking with excitement to meet him. And he patted me on my head. And I remember being frustrated because I had worked so hard to get my high top fade <laughs> in good condition. Um, but after that, they used to have these things called Encyclopedia Britannicas, 
And so I went home and started reading about Dr. King and saw Ambassador Andrew Young's name. And then I wanted to know everything about him. And so I learned that he went to Howard University. So I decided I was going to Howard University. And so um, I really did try to mirror his path to the greatest extent that I could. And then because, because God works his way in our plans, I've become a trustee at Howard University on their board of trustees. At the same time, he's a trustee. And so we spend a year together developing a personal relationship. So I'm 19, getting ready to be 20, graduating soon. I was thinking about taking a job in New York City at the time after Howard. And I remember it like it was yesterday. He put his hands on my shoulder. He said, son, you should come home because Atlanta is going to need a mayor like you in 20 years. And so he has been in, in my life ever since then. And on the night that I won uh, the mayoral election uh, in 2009, uh, in the suite at the Hyatt, Hyatt Hotel in downtown Atlanta, um, when they came in to tell me that I had won, Ambassador Young was sitting by my side with tears of happiness rolling down his face. And so I always felt like that's, those, that's just one example of those only in Atlanta stories. And so to this day, as recently, you know, as last night, his son Bo and I mm -hmm. were together uh, at an event. And so there is this generational stickiness in our city that I think makes it a unique place in the world. And it was Julian Bond's spirit. It was Ambassador Young's spirit. Um, it was individuals like Mayor Ivan Allen's spirit. Um, it was individuals like the former CEO of Coca-Cola and their spirits that used to meet in rooms all over the city of Atlanta and really worked at the issues related to race and rights uh, in a way that I think is unique in the United States of America. And so the fruits of those relationships show in every way. Um, when you go to a football game in Atlanta, there's no stadium in the United States that has black and white people in the proportions that we do for a football game. When you go to a basketball game, there's no basketball arena in the United States of America that looks like our basketball arenas. And so what I think that we have done here is our commitment to what I call the Atlanta Covenant um, has made our city uh, the beacon and the primary source of capital investment, first from the Northeast and now globally. The story doesn't get told enough about how we created this tapestry. It did not simply pop into being. There are a lot of people weaving and taking care of it and patching it up and cleaning it. And so that's what I'm trying to convey. The answer is yes. I mean, what, as you well know, when you can see something and touch it, you're more likely to believe that it's achievable. And uh, Julian Bond was an international star who lived around the corner and whose children I knew in high school. So Julian Bond's daughter, Julia, and I were the same year and knew each other in high school and her brother, Michael, was older. So the children of these uh, folks, um, like Kwame Abernathy, all of them were walking around with us. So it really made it more real. And then something happened real time that even made it more powerful. And that's during uh, the Rodney King beating and the violence that followed in cities afterwards. Um, Maynard Jackson focused our mind on the SNCC model because he didn't want the city of Atlanta destroyed because of the Rodney King beatings. And so at that time, uh, I was a part of the panel that he assembled of the new generation of young people. And then we were actually counseled by people like Julian Bond um, who were actively engaged in the civil rights movement. So basically you had all of that energy and passion that occurs at moments of difficulty and it needed to be counseled so that, uh, so that it, it didn't become something negative. 
So, so right then at 16, 17, 18 years old, you're really in a room with the people that actually changed the course of history. And they are counseling you on how to engage in constructive rather than destructive behavior. And considering that if, you know, if Rodney King was 1992, and if my math is correct, you were 21 years old at the time. That's right. So you're just a few years younger mm -hmm. than Julian was when he was elected to the to the General Assembly. That's correct. Right. And I think remember they didn't they denied him his seat. So oh, he had to, be, had to who could ever forget that he would be seated. But yes. And then if you fast forward to 1998, I was the youngest member of the Georgia General Assembly elected. So I was the youngest member in my class uh, elected to the to the Georgia General Assembly. So some interesting parallels there. Yes. But you yeah. had a lot better luck in actually being seated. Yeah, they did seat me. And, and I learned from Ambassador Young. I mean, I'll give you a quick anecdote that reinforces that point. So Ambassador Young and I were had spent an evening at Barack Obama's White House. So he had had an event for um, one occasion or another and, we, and Ambassador Young and I were headed back home. So we're in the Delta Crown Room and he and I were engaged in a discussion about what something I thought was really important. And a woman comes up and taps me on the shoulder and asks me to take a picture. And Greg, I turned to her, trying, focused on Ambassador Young and said, man, you know, I'm having a conversation. And he put his hand on my forearm and he said, take the picture. He said, always take the picture. He said, Martin and I dreamed about the day when a person would want to take a photo of us with us right and this woman happened to be white mm -hmm. and so i mean just having that gentle lesson i never would have processed it that way and because of that i've taken ten thousand pictures <laughs> now really because but it was that direct instant calm coaching that i got that changed my behavior for my entire time since. And so every time I'm somewhere and somebody wants a photo, uh, I think about him saying, Martin, and I dreamed of the day when folks would certainly of other races would want to take a photo with a black man. So given everything that you've talked about, what it must have felt like when you were the mayor, when the Atlanta student movement marker was unveiled at the old Yates and Milton drugstore. And then later when that portion of Fair Street was renamed Atlanta Student Movement Boulevard. I mean, that, that had to be a moment that I could only imagine was surreal. It's one of the high points of my life. And I was glad to be there and I was just thrilled to be there and see Michael. Uh, Michael Bond actually was the thrust of that effort to finally have those folks recognized. And so, as you know, anybody that tries to pursue the blessings of these big jobs, you, you, you do it to get stuff done. And for all of the time that had passed and no roses had been given, or at least not appropriate roses had been given by a city for which their work and sacrifice undergirds the national and international story of who Atlanta is. And to be the one that was able to make it so in partnership and with the Atlanta City Council, it's uh, one of those high days in my life, the way that you remember your, your favorite baseball game. Mm -hmm. You're a collector and, and lover of baseball. And I see Hank Aaron um, over your shoulder and, and Dale Murphy. The way that you feel on those magical days when you See, really special baseball, if you amplify that by about 10, that's how I felt when I was sitting on that stage as we, as, as we recognized and honored people who um, do not get as much light as Dr. King and Julian Bond and Ambassador Young and Congressman John Lewis and Reverend Joe Lowry. I'd like to, to wind up with, with two questions. And the first is, if you could talk about the impact that Julian Bond had on you personally and professionally. You've mentioned your friendship with Michael. 
your yes. friendship with Julia, whose nickname is Cookie, if I'm not mistaken. You're right. Impact of Julia and Bun on me was possibility. Um, what I think isn't talked enough about Julian Bond is just his sheer talent. So I have been around him on many occasions. You can't be around him without knowing that you're around, be around somebody special. And you know that when you're in a room with someone that has that extra quality, that je ne sais quoi, mm -hmm. you know when you're around somebody like that. And so to see what that is like, um makes you want to find it within yourself and so you're not copying who that individual is you don't want to be a copy but you can be enhanced and you can learn and you can't you you can't want to come up with your own best version right and so uh, i have on a suit and a tie on a sunday while we're doing this interview because Julian Bond would have had on a suit and a tie while he was doing this interview. And Ambassador Andrew Young would have on a suit and a tie and a jacket while he's doing this interview. And Dr. Martin Luther King would have had on a suit and a tie and a jacket because it was so important to put forth a positive image as a black man and to not be bitter about that reality, not be upset about that the, that reality, but understand what comes with the job. And that's what I learned from Julian Bond, what comes with the job. And if you talk to Michael and if you talk to Julia, all of the sacrifices that, it, that, he, that his family made, they knew that all of this came with the job. And that's my biggest Julian Bond lesson, what comes with the job. And I'm sitting at my, with my daughter Maria Kristen at the pancake house on yesterday. And it was my birthday and I was trying to have a pancake breakfast with my daughter. Um, and folks come up to me, she's totally fine. She just asked them to say thank you after the photo. That's her thing. Remember That's to say, she says, remember to say thank you. <laughs> but she, you know, she doesn't complain. She didn't get frustrated. And I think about Julia, I think about Michael, because I can't imagine when I'm with Bo last night. So Bo Young and I were together last night. And I, and I know that when Bo was a child and he was spending time with his dad, all of the times that folks came up to Ambassador Young. And so when you're in these positions, and fortunate enough to be in this position, I was the second youngest mayor in the history of the city. You need to get what comes with the job. And you get what comes with the job by seeing people do, who, who did it better than you did. That's the blessing that I have. How do you see the future of the modern civil rights movement, whether it's political empowerment, uh, voting rights protection, grassroots organizing, and the work of organizations like Black Voters Matter, Black Lives Matter, what's different now than the generation that you looked to when you were coming up? Um, what's different now is the intensity, speed, and the potential um, for um, greater confrontation. And so when I was advised by Ambassador Young, when I had different protests or civic engagement challenges as a mayor, because when you're a mayor, you have a different role than a citizen. Um, you can feel in the air that the patience and planning and all of the rest that occurred during the civil rights movement in America um, is going to be harder to maintain because there is not that patience the speed of information is overwhelming. And so the risk related to all those interactions are just harder and more complex to manage. They're really, really tough. And there's an entire generation of people that have zero patience for certain kinds of behavior. And so that makes all of that the dynamics harder because anytime you can't talk and have a calm conversation, um, you're in a tougher business. 
That's the biggest difference that I see right now. On the excitement side, the excitement side is, is that um, I think I see a much more broad racial coalition than during the previous civil rights movement, right? And so I see an intensity in our white brothers and our Latino brothers and our Asian brothers and sisters um, that used to just be black people, right? So I was watching a debate uh, last night over an issue. And I'll tell you, I mean, we were having a debate about the way that Dominique Wilkins had been treated at La Bilbo Cat. Yeah, I read about that. Buckethead. And so a lot of folks, that's what came up. And what was so satisfying to me was the intensity of the Indian people and the white people was as great as the black people <laughs> around their offense. I mean, their dial was actually a little more intense than the black people who were there. That's a massive shift from where we were um, when Dr. King and Ambassador Young and Judy and Bond were in a constant tug of war with the clergy community to be more engaged and dynamic and more outspoken. And so what gives me so much hope and why I believe that post 524, 525 George Floyd's death, what gives me so much hope is there's this shared feeling that these issues have to change faster because we spent so many years and folks miss their whole lives, right? Not having a fair shot and a fair shake. And so anybody that's watching this needs to understand whether you're a white leader or a black leader or an Asian leader or an Indian leader, that the time frame you have to deal with challenge is much shorter. And if you wanna have integrity on the issue, you better be able to point to what you were doing when no one was looking. And that's where, that's where I think we are today.